Welcome to the third lecture of Bio 120. Today we're going to be looking at the cell wall, surface structures, and inclusions. This will be a continuation from the previous lecture that we gave for Tuesday. Now, the bacterial cell wall is one of the most studied structures in bacteria. It is a rigid structure that protects the cytoplasmic membrane from rupture. It also helps maintain cellular shape. It is not a selective barrier to small molecules. That is still the purpose and the major function of the cell membrane. The cell wall houses many proteins needed for cell wall biosynthesis. As well as in bacteria, it is composed mainly of peptidoglycan. And we're going to be looking at the structure of this molecule. In gram-positive bacteria, it also contains stachoic acids. Now, this image from the book shows you the difference between the cell wall of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. As shown in this figure, the gram-positive cell wall is mostly composed of peptidoglycan, a very thick layer of peptidoglycan. The gram-negative cell wall is composed of a thin layer of peptidoglycan as well as an outer membrane. So what you can observe here from this transmittance electron micrograph at the bottom here in the gram-positive bacteria is the cytoplasmic membrane together with a very thick structure of peptidoglycan. And when you do a scanning electron micrograph of a gram-positive bacteria like Bacillus subtilis, you can notice that the bacteria is very smooth because the gram-positive cell wall is mainly made of peptidoglycan, which is very uniform. On the other hand, when we look at the transmitted electron micrograph of the gram-negative cell wall, what we can see is the cytoplasmic membrane being covered by a very thin layer of peptidoglycan that looks like a hair here in this image. And on top of that, what you can then see is another membrane, and that will be the outer membrane. That gives a gram-negative bacteria like E. coli a very ruffled appearance on the cell surface because of the riches that the cell has from the outer membrane. Again, that outer membrane, it's not a permeability barrier, and we're going to look at that more closely later. So what is peptidoglycan? Peptidoglycan, as the word states, it's a combination of peptides and sugars. It is a chain of repeating interconnected sugars and amino acids. The sugars are two, N-acetylglucosamine, and N-acetylmuramic acid. Those are the two molecules mostly involved in bacterial peptidoglycan layer. Now, the amino acids are going to be special. Gram-negative bacteria has one particular amino acid, diaminopimelic acid, which I'm going to show you a structure in a moment, that is not found in gram-positive bacteria. You also are going to have different amino acids. You're going to have L-lysine, D-glutamic acid, and D-alanine. So remember from your chemistry, the L versus D nomenclature for amino acids that um, are able to direct light from to the right or to the left. Now, what is the function of the peptidoglycan layer? Well, it provides the characteristic cell size and shape of bacteria. It also provides protection against osmotic lysis and turbo pressure. If you don't know, turgor pressure is the force exerted outward on a cell wall and membrane by the water molecules contained inside the cell. This force gives the cell its rigidity and may help to keep its shape. This is most likely something that you study when you were looking at plant cells, because plant cells require the turgor pressure in order to erect the stem of the plant. Now, the peptidoglycan layer is very thin in gram-negative bacteria sometimes between one or more layers and about 2 to 7 nanometers in thickness. Versus in gram-positive bacteria, the peptidoglycan layer is very thick. It has many layers between 20 to 80 nanometers thick. Now, this image over here shows you the basic structure of the peptidoglycan layer. The N-acetylglucosamine sugars are labeled with a G, and the N-acetylburamic acid sugars are labeled with an M. And as you can see, what you have is intermittent sugars, an M followed by a G, followed by an M, followed by a G, followed by an M. Those are labeled here as glycosidic bonds in the x-axis. 
each independent chain of peptidoglycan is attached to another chain through the n acetylmuramic acid sugar. And those bonds are shown over here in between the M's as blue bonds. And they are in the image display in the y-axis. We're going to see that whereas along the x-axis of the peptidoglycan layer you have the glycosidic bonds, along the y-axis you have the different units attached by peptidic bonds. Now, let's take a look more closely at the structure of one repeating unit of peptidoglycan. Like we mentioned earlier, the N-acetylglucosamine is labeled with the G and the N-acetylmuramic acid is labeled with the M. Now, the glycosidic bond between the G and the M sugars is linked by a beta-1 to 4 glycosidic bond, shown over here in the middle and over here as well. That bond is particularly sensitive to the enzyme lysozyme. Both sugars have the N-acetyl group, shown here in this circle. Now, N-acetylmuramic acid is only found on bacteria and not in archaea or eukaryotes. The amino acid links that are joining the N-acetylmuramic acid sugars are formed in gram-negative bacteria by four amino acids. The first one, shown over here, is alanine. Next to alanine, you're going to have a D-glutamic acid. After glutamic acid, you're going to have the diaminopimelic acid, shown here. And the last one is going to be another molecule of now D-alanine, so the isomer of the L-alanine. This is the basic glycan tetrapeptide, which is the basic unit of the peptidoglycan layer, and is used in order to make the peptidoglycan layer during cell wall synthesis. Now, the diaminopimelic acid, it is a derivative, derivative excuse me, of the amino acid lysine. In the R chain of the amino acid lysine, where you will have a hydrogen molecule, now you have a carboxylic acid molecule. And therefore, what you have now are two ends that can form a peptide bond. One here with the original alpha carbon, where you have the carboxyl group, the alpha carbon, and the amino group, and another one at the end of the side chain, where you have another carboxylic group, a carbon, and another amine group. Now, the repeating unit, it's different in gram-positive bacteria. Both G and M sugars are linked, again, by a beta-1,4 glycosidic bond, which is, as I mentioned earlier, sensitive to the lysosome digestion. However, N-acetylmuramic acid is linked to a tetrapeptide with alternating L and D amino acids, as shown over here, in both gram-positive and gram-negative. Gram-positive cell walls do not have DAP. They only have an L lysine molecule. To the L lysine molecule, we're now going to see the addition of an interbridge formed by five different glycines. And we're going to see that in a moment. Let's take a look at that in a second. Now, the connection of the peptido and the glycan unit in gram negatives happens between the DAP molecule to the alanine molecule. So you have in position one the L alanine, position two the D glutamic acid, three DAP, and form the D alanine. So to the DAP molecule, because of that other carb bonyl and amino group that has at the end of the R group, now you can have a connection to the D-alanine molecule from an alternative neighboring peptidoglycan layer. So the 3-DAP molecule is connected to the fourth D-alanine of the neighboring molecule. So that is where the tetrapeptide has a direct cross-linking at position 3 and 4. It is shown that E. coli has between 1 to 3 peptidoglycan stack layers in its cell wall. Now, a gram-positive bacteria like Staphylococcus aureus has about 25 stack peptidoglycan layers, and between the amino acid 3, L-lysine, and the amino acid 4, D-alanine, now you have the 5 glycine 
amino acid interbridge. And that amino acid interbridge connects the cross, uh, connects the peptidoglycan layer from position 3 to position 4. So the same binding happens in both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, except for the extension. This is going to give a different overall structure to the gram-positive versus gram-negative peptidoglycan layer. As shown in this image, the pentaglycine cross-link bridge makes the distance between the glycan backbones of the peptidoglycan a lot longer. Whereas in gram-negative bacteria, the distance between the glycan backbone unit is a lot more tight. In a sense, this is one of the reasons why possibly only three to four peptidoglycan layers in gram-negative bacteria are usually found versus many different layers in gram-positive bacteria. Altogether, when the, the molecules are associated nicely, they form a very nice, tight structure. Now, in gram-positive bacteria, the multiple layers of peptidoglycan are sort of sewn in together by molecules of tachoic acids. As shown over here in the right, you have the thick layer of peptidoglycan, and within the th them, you have this uh, breadstick-looking proteins that are called tachoic acid. And tachoic acids are polymers of a molecule called glycerol, or rivitol. And rivitol is a 5-carbon alcohol, shown over here. Attached to that rivitol molecule, you're going to have in the carbon 1 a phosphate group, and in the carbon 5 another phosphate group. That allows them to then be... Um, linked to one another in a similar fashion to how the DNA molecule is linked to one another. Now, to the second, third, and fourth carbon of the rivitol molecule, you have amino acids, two the alanines and one the glucose. But you're actually two amino acids and one sugar molecule, excuse me. So now, the tachoic acids are covalently linked to the peptidoglycan layer, and they seem to to be like needles that are threading the peptidoglycan layer and maintaining it in place. One special type of tachoic acid is also a lipid, and it has a lipid attachment, and that is called the lipotachoic acid. That helps anchor the cytoplasmic, excuse me, that helps anchor the peptidoglycan layer into the cytoplasmic membrane, maintaining it very tightly. One thing that we have been able to show is that the peptidoglycan layer in gram-positive microorganisms can be formed by having peptidoglycan cables that are distributed along the, in, along the structure of the microorganisms, as shown here in figure 27 point, uh, in figure 2.27, pardon me, um, in the upper structure. Now, the cell wall of gram-positive microorganisms is very different, and it contains, as we mentioned, an outer membrane and a peptidoglycan layer. Now, we're going to take a moment to look at the composition of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. Now, the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria it composed of an outer membrane, and then outer membrane have two different leaflets. It has the lower leaflet that is pointing to the peptidoglycan layer, and that one is contained by phospholipids. Now, the upper leaflet of the peptidoglycan layer is composed of phospholipids and special lipids called lipopolysaccharides, shown over here by the square and this... Uh, uh, hexagrams. Now, the outer membrane is about 12 to 15 nanometers thick due to the very long LPS lipids that are present on it. The outer membrane provides a permeability barrier to very large molecules, but not small molecules. Therefore, it is not, as the cytoplasmic membrane, it's not a permeability barrier. It is it's a structure that enhances stability. The small lipopolyprotein anchors that are um, shown over here are able to bind to the peptidoglycan layer and maintain the outer membrane 
in place. The LPS molecule layer, the lipopolysaccharide layer on the outer membrane, decreases the permeability of many molecules, for example, bile salts. And bile salts, therefore, are used to reduce the cell growth of gram-positive microorganisms because they can permeate very nicely. So only gram-negative microorganisms, for example, can grow in the presence of bile salts. It is also the endotoxin of gram-negative bacteria. And the immune system of many people form a very strong reaction against the lipidase of the, of the lipopolysaccharide. So here is the structure of a subunit of LPS. We're going to start over here on the right, looking at the lipid A molecule. The lipid A molecule is a phosphorylated glucosamine disaccharide, shown here by these two units. They are bound together to one another, and they have phosphates attached. To them, you have multiple fatty acids that are attached to them. They could be caprionic, lauric, myristic, palmitic, and steric phospholipids. Now, to one of the glucosamine disaccharides, you have attachment of the core polysaccharide. And the core polysaccharide is a domain that is present in all LPS molecules, and it is the same with all the LPS molecules from different gram-negative microorganisms. It has three 2-keto-3-deoxyoctanate molecules attached to one another, as shown here in green. And it's also composed of heptosis, galactose, glucose, galactose, glucose, and N-acetyl glucosamine molecules. The core domain always contains an, an oligosaccharide component that is directly attached to the lipidate component. Last is where you have the repeated unit of the O-specific polysaccharide. And that O-specific polysaccharide, it varies between strain and strain of microorganisms and within species. It is believed, for example, that certain strains of E. coli have about 125 different O-specific polysaccharides. One example of the composition of the O-specific polysaccharide could have galactose, rhamnose, mannose, and evacuose sugars, which are then repeated up to 25 to 30 times. This is the, this very, very long polysaccharide um, subunit. It's what gives the outer membrane of gram-negative microorganisms its ability to be impermeable to many molecules. And as I mentioned, it's going to be very different from different species of gram-negative bacteria. Now, as we mentioned, the outer membrane of the gram-negative cell wall, it's composed of many lipids in the inner leaflet, phospholipids, but the outer phospholipid region has the LPS molecule, which makes it a very nice thick coating. So it's mostly LPS with little other phospholipids. But it also contains proteins. One of these proteins, for example, is going to be the lipoprotein that we mentioned earlier, which is also called the brown lipoprotein, that help connects the outer membrane to the peptidoglycan layer. The other molecule you're already familiar with is going to be the porin channel. And the porin channel is a very large structure, shown over here at the bottom, that forms a tri-channel, where Molecules of fairly large size will be excluded, but other molecules, including ions, sugars, will be able to pass very nicely. So again, not very specific. It allows the passage of hydrophilic molecules that are less than 600 to 700 Daltons in size. Some porins are specific and contain binding sites for some molecule, for example, the vitamin B, the vitamin B12 porin. And the porin molecule is always folded into bare barrels, whereas other proteins are always found as alpha helical structures. Now, as we discussed before, and it's shown here in this image, the, there is a space between the outer membrane and the cytoplasmic membrane. And that place is called the periplasmic space. 
it is mostly identified in gram-negative bacteria, though gram-positive bacteria has also another periplasmic space between the LPS, excuse me, between the peptidoglycan layer and the membrane. Now, this space is filled with proteins. We're going to see that it has about 10% of the cell's total proteins. Most of them are specialized nutrient-binding proteins. Some of them are electron transfer proteins. Other ones help with hydrolytic enzymes. And it contains the enzymes required for cell wall and outer membrane, membrane assembly. And this is where the peptidoglycan layer is located in gram-negative bacteria. Because of the high contents of proteins, it has a gel-like consistency and is highly hydrated. So the diffusion of ions through it is very slow. Now, we talked about the fact that gram-negative and gram-positive microorganisms have a peptidoglycan layer, but now we're going to look at how the archaea has a different organization in the peptidoglycan that makes it different and therefore uh, changes name to pseudopeptidoglycan. It's also called pseudomerin. Like the peptidoglycan layer, it's composed of sugars that are connected to one another. But in the, but the difference between the sugars, um, the connection between the sugars in the bacterial peptidoglycan, which is a beta-1,4 link, the units in the archaeal peptidoglycan are linked by the beta-1,3 link. And that link is resistance to the enzyme lysozyme. The sugars are two, acetylglucosamine, which we already saw in, in bacteria, in gram-positive and gram-negative bacterial peptidoglycan, but it doesn't have muramic acid. It has another molecule called n acetyltalosaminuronic acid, or NAT, shown here by a T. Now, the acetyl group, it's positioned in a different location in NAT versus the n acetylglucosamine acid which is usually positioned lower. Like the peptidoglycan layers in bacteria, it also contains peptides, except that the difference is that these are all L-amino acids. There are no D-amino acids present in the archaeal peptidoglycan. And like present before, you're going to have linking of the amino acids between different glycan backbones by the amino acids present. So we're going to see that the process in which the amino acids are linked together is called transpeptidation. And transpeptidation is, in, is mediated by the enzyme transpeptidase. And the enzyme transpeptidase in bacteria is sensitive to the uh, antibiotic penicillin. Because of the different kind of amino acids present in the archaeal pseudopeptidoglycan, transpeptidation is resistant to the antibiotic penicillin. Now, not all microorganisms have the same cell wall. Other ones have been modified by having something called the S layer. And the S layer is a paracrystalline surface structure that is composed of proteins. You can appreciate the beautiful structure of the S layer in figure 2. 2.31. Depending on the type of protein, it could be a trimer, a pentamer, or a hexamer. Now, this is a tile lattice that provides protection against pH, osmotic stress, enzymes, or the immune defenses. It is a layer that goes over the plasma membrane. So it could be found outside of the membrane and in some microorganisms outside of the cell wall and is found in the majority of archaea and in some bacteria. For example, methanococcus, which are archaea, have a single S layer, but other organisms have S layers on top of having cell wall components. So the S layer in its various organizations, it's strong enough to provide protection against the turgor pressure. So with this part of the lecture, we stop now about the different cell wall components in bacteria, archaea. And what we're going to look now are some of the surface structures and inclusions that are present in prokaryotes. And this is the next section of
of the lecture. Now, many bacteria have external structures such as the fimbrae and pili. Here is an example of a bacteria that is attached to a substrate by this hair-like structure called fimbrae. Fimbrae are filamentous protein structures that extend from the cell surface. So, mostly plasma in gram negative, they allow the organism to adhere to tissues and to help form biofilms. Some microorganisms display a kind of motility called twitching. They're going to twitch and the fimbrae is responsible for that phenomenon. They are present abundantly in the cell, about a thousand fimbrae per cell. They are very small, between 3 to 10 nanometers in diameter and about several micrometers in length. The pili, or pillus in singular, is a different structure composed of different proteins. It is a conduit for conjugation, which is bacterial mating, and is shown over here between one microorganism, which we call the male, here in the left, which as you can see also has some fimbrae, and that pillows it's uh, extended to a female microorganism shown here on the right. Usually the pillows is invisible by microscopy and to be able to see it effectively we cover it with phages, small bacterial viruses that are able to bind to the pillows and therefore we can see the structure a lot more clearly. That's why we call it a receptor for phages. All, also, excuse me, the pillows could be used as a structure for motility, and we're going to discuss that later when we look at how bacteria move. You usually find between 1 to 10 pili per cell, and some of them are very long, between 9 to 10 nanometers in length. It's also a retractable unit. It could be extended and retracted. Both the fimbrae and the pili are external structures. But we're going to look now at some of the internal structures in microorganisms. As we have discussed before, they do not have many membrane-bound organelles, but they still have structures inside. Some of them are called cell inclusions, and those cell inclusions are storage compartments for bacteria where they can save byproducts in their metabolism. Some of them are used for energy reserve or for some kind of macromolecule building block. For example, here in the upper pictures, we have some sulfur respiring bacteria that will produce sulfur granules, shown over here. Also, they are used to reduce the osmotic pressure by tying up molecules in particular form. They're considered solutes, and by having a great amount of those solutes inside the cell, the microorganism is considered to be osmotically stable. Now, some of them can be considered to have a single membrane layer. For example, the polybeta hydroxybutyrate granules inside bacteria are designed to store the polybeta hydroxybutyrate, which is a carbon storage, or also they can contain glycogen granules. Another type of cell inclusion that we're going to be looking at are the gas vacuoles. And we talked about the gas vacuoles in the previous lecture. They're present in many bacteria that are living in water. For example, cyanobacteria, purple and green photosynthetic bacteria, and other aquatic microorganisms. As shown up here um, in the electron micrograph, they have different structures. Some of them... Um, could be long cylinders that when you cut them across, they look like a honeycomb, and other ones, they can form small uh, balloons. Now, these structures are designed for buoyancy, and they allow the microorganism to float to be able to be closer to light sources, oxygen, and nutrient levels. Now, the gas vesicles are inside the bacteria, and they are collapsible, allowing the microorganism to float when it needs to. Now, they are composed by a quote-unquote membrane that is exclusively made of protein, about 2 nanometers in thickness, impermeable to water and other solutes, but however, they are permeable to gas. Now, in many bacteria where these have been studied, they are composed of two different proteins, 
GVPA, gas vesicle protein A, is the major component, and as shown over here in this image, it makes the gas vesicle shell. You have a second molecule, GVPC, for gas vesicle protein C, which is a minor component, and it's shown over here in yellow, and that provides the strength for the shell. Now, the shape of the vesicle, it's genetically encoded and it depends on the GVPA and GVPC interaction, and that is dependent on species. So though the function of the gas vesicle in many different microorganisms is the same, the shape is going to be different depending on the proteins GBPA and GBPC. Now, another interesting internal structure of bacteria is the endospore. And the endosporm is mainly formed by a subgroup of gram-positive bacteria, the sporulators. And from that, we have bacillus, clostridium, and sporosarcina. Very few gram-negative bacteria form spores. One example is the sporomusa ovata. And today we don't, we don't know of any archaea that can form spores. Now, the spore is a differentiated dormant cell. Sporulation is a cellular differentiation event, and therefore it is genetically encoded and activated. Cells which are growing in... Um, Environments rich with nutrients do not sporulate. You can think of the spore as an escape vessel. When the going gets stuff, the cell sporulates. Because of that, the spores are resistant to many of the uh, damages that can come from heat, chemicals like acids, and radiation, giving the spore protection when the going gets tough. It allows the microorganism to survive the difficult times. Interestingly, some spores have been isolated from mummies which are 250 million years old. And when triggered, those spores have been able to germinate and become viable vegetative cells. Now, sporulating bacteria can generate spores in three different locations. And again, this is genetically encoded. Some bacteria, like the ones shown here in the left, are terminal spore-forming bacteria, where, as you can see, the spore is formed at the end of the microorganism. Other ones are called subterminal, because the spore is formed almost at the end of the microorganisms, but not quite. The last type of sporulating bacteria are the central sporulators, where the spore is formed right in the middle of the microorganism. So we can differentiate sporulating gram-positive bacteria by the place where they form the spore, in the terminal location, subterminal, or central position. Now, spores are the bane of the food, industrial, and miracle microbiology. Many bacteria which are pathogens, like like the anthrax bacterium or tetanus are spore forming microorganisms. So clostridium and the bacteria from which are one of the medically relevant spores formings are then very resistant to treatment and can survive a lot of the sterilization mechanisms that we currently have. Now, let's take a look at the structure of the spore. Here is a vegetative cell forming a spore, and by that stain you can see the green spore being formed in here, and this is one spore uh, labeled with GFP, so you can see it nicely. And here in the TEM image of the spore, you can see the multiple different parts of the spore. Now, the spore is not a cell. It is a escape unit. So, it's not alive, it is a dormant stage. The main part of the sporum in the outside is the exosporium, and the exosporium is an outer layer of the endospore with a thin protein covering. Now, those are formed by spore-specific proteins, and those spore-specific proteins are usually not made during a vegetative cell, only when the cell becomes endangered would the cell activate the genetic program for spore forming and those proteins will be made. Now, the spore coat is a layer of spore-specific proteins that encodes the spore. It is impermeable to many of the toxic molecules that we use in microbiology to eliminate cells, 
and is responsible for the cell's resistance to chemicals. It also contains enzymes involved in spore germination. The other part is the cortex, shown over here, and the cortex can occupy, can occupy excuse me, almost half the spore volume and is made of peptidoglycan, a thin layer of peptidoglycan that serves as the initial space where the new peptidoglycan layer are going to be made when the cell actually germinates, when the spore actually germinates. It is a little bit less cross-linked than the peptidoglycan found in vegetative cells. Now, the main part of the spore is the core, or it could also be called the spore protoplast. It contains the core wall, the cytoplasmic membrane, the cytoplasm, quote unquote, of the spore, which is not really a true cytoplasm. It has the nucleoid, which contains the DNA. I will have the ribosomes and other essential molecules. Now, this area also has high amounts of dipicolinic acid, a molecule of dipicolinic acid is shown over here, which is hexose molecule, an amine, uh, nitrogen atom over here, and two carboxyl groups. Now, because of the negative charge of that carboxyl group, the dipicolinic acid is able to bind calcium, which is expressed at a really high amount inside the spore, and forms very long chains of dipicolinic acid and calcium. Those molecules reduces the amount of water inside the cell, in effect dehydrating the spore. And because of that, the high dipicolinic acid carbon molecule are able to remove a lot of the water, are able to intercalate into the DNA and change the structure of DNA from DNA type B to DNA type A. And at that state, the DNA type A is more stable and therefore more resistant to radiation. Other molecules, excuse me, are found inside the core, and some of them are the small acid-soluble DNA binding protein, or SASP, and they are able to bind to DNA in the ADNA form, and is, are able to protect it also against heat, radiation, desiccation, and chemicals. So this, this escape pod, the spore, is designed to protect the cell in times of low availability of nutrients. Now, Endospore formation is a developmental process, and this is what I'm going to describe here with the following slide. We start with a vegetative cell that is going to be divided into two different cells, and therefore it's going around through normal cell division. But when nutrients are low, the vegetative cell is going to activate a genetic program which is going to lead to the asymmetric cell division is going to commit to spirulation in a stage called a stage 1. And what you get is a cell division where we have an area called the prespore, and the prespore is separated from the mother cell by an area called septum. Now, the prespore is the engulf inside the mother cell, and that engulfment is going to lead to the formation of the cortex, here shown in stage four. The cortex begins to have the cortex structure, the cell wall, and the cytoplasmic membrane. And as the sporulation process continues, you begin to form the spore coat, calcium begins to be uptaken, and the SAS protein begins to be made, and dipicolinic acid also gets to get made, which is going to bind to calcium, dehydrating the spore and allowing now the binding into DNA that is going to change it from the structure B to the structure A type. The spore continues to mature and once it's ready it's going to lyse the cells and that induces the release of the free spore. At a certain time when the spore is able to then mature, it can then germinate and germination will lead to the formation of a non-vegetative state which can then grow. The spore is completely metabolically inactive. So the following table shows the difference between the endospore and the vegetative cells. The endospore, it's very reflectile. It, it looks like a very bright structure inside the cell, versus the normal vegetative cell is not reflectant. The 
Vegetal itself has low amount of calcium inside versus the spore has very high amount of calcium. And in the live vegetal cells, you do not have dipicolinic acid versus in the spore you do. Now, enzymatic activity in the cell that is alive, it's very high versus in the spore is very low. And whereas the living vegetative cell is respiring, the endospore is not. Now, you have plenty of micromolecule synthesis in the vegetative cells, but no micromolecule synthesis in the endospore. This cell, it's very sensitive to heat, radiation, and chemicals, versus the spore, it's very resistant to all those assaults. The cell is sensitive to lysozyme, where the spore is resistant. The cell is basically 80 to 90% water, versus the spore is very dehydrated. And the small acid-soluble spore proteins are absent in the live cell, but they're present in the spore. So you have the major differences in the two, between the two. Now, the spore can remain in the spore state for many years, but it can then germinate. And for germination, it requires activation. Activation usually requires heating the spore to non-lethal temperatures, which is about a, a lethal temperature will be 120 to 130 degrees Celsius. But you also have to have nutrients. Now, the germination, shown over here in this side, you can see that the cell begins to lose its refractivity. It's now becoming like a vegetative cell, more opaque. It swells, it ruptures, and the proteins begin to be absorbed by the cell. Now, you lose the resistance to heat and stress, and at a certain point, you have the release of the spore components, and those are discarded. The cell becomes now metabolically active. Activation of germination can be triggered after heat and it will be propagated by the by the presence of nutrients and metabolism cell needs. At this point the spore protoplast makes new components. It starts metabolizing, it starts respiring, it emerges from the spore code and develops again into an active vegetative bacterium. With this you conclude the lecture and be ready for a quiz about it on Thursday.